We're in the middle of our missions conference. What a wonderful weekend it has been. We had Lynn Q. Thames from Child Evangelism Fellowship here on Friday evening for the youth night. We had Bonnie Leishman here last night for the missionary banquet. Today we have the privilege of having Reverend Keith Coleman, the Executive Director for the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. Now I know none of you have ever met him before, so be sure to greet him afterwards. <laughs> He's a wonderful guest, always delighted to have him with us. A man we know very well, a man sound in doctrine, and a man very skilled in missions practice also. Lives for Christ, glorifies Christ and the things that he does and the way in which he directs that board. Brother Coleman, we are delighted to have you with us today. Come and preach the word. Yes, I sometimes get confused with the other, Keith. I'll tell you the differences later on. We did have a good time last night with Bonnie, and uh, as she mentioned the little story in her <clears throat> testimony before beginning last night about always being ready, and uh, actually, uh, Gary Johnson wasn't able to come. He had some problems at times feeling lightheaded, and... Uh, didn't feel that the travel would be wise uh, because they will be leaving for Kenya in June, so he wanted to get that taken care of. So it was really Thursday when Bonnie gets the phone call and says, Bonnie, are you ready? <laughs> so in practice once again, and uh, true to uh, her own statement, um, she was ready and we're thankful for the opportunity that the Lord gave her to share just some other ideas. Uh, Luxembourg, I've never even thought about that little dot on the map, and uh, I knew that she had gone there, and it was good to see her pictures there. Shall we just pause for a word of prayer? Father, we're thankful as this opportunity in this Lord's Day is before us to allow your word to speak forth truth. May our hearts, as always, be soil that is uh, rich, fertilized, in order that good seed sown upon it will produce great abundance of fruit. May it be so in our own hearts this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not sure about your own personal testimony, how you came to Jesus Christ. I know mine and my wife's, but I guess that's probably about the limit of what we have, at least as far as I know. There are some testimonies that seem to draw more interest than others because they have a tendency to be more dramatic. Uh, one that I found has have found interesting was that was of Nikki Cruz, who had been a gang leader in New York City, and uh, out of it, the uh, Cross and Switchblade Switch book and a movie. Uh, but I found most recently that there's a new movie that he's putting out. It's entitled Thousand Pieces. And it came as uh, David Wilkerson, uh, uh, his preaching in his own ministry, came to really bring Nikki to himself. And apparently, Nikki was threatening David with his knife and saying, I'll cut you into a thousand pieces. And David responded by saying, even if there's a thousand pieces, I will not cease to love you. And uh, so it was a great testimony. So that will be coming out. And I'm sure Pastor will keep his eye open for that one. Um, uh, it would be a great movie to be able to see. However, many testimonies don't sound as dramatic. So we don't necessarily consider them as exciting as others. And I think we do that because we categorize some people uh, as being greater sinners than others. Gang members, people of the night, those who are in prison, as compared to the man behind the counter at McDonald's or my aunt. So we come up with the false notion that greater sinners need a greater effort on God's part in order to redeem them as compared to me or you. Now one powerfully exciting testimony was that of the Pharisee Saul of Tarsus. I mean, here was a man with a horrible reputation. In Acts 7, Stephen gives one of those poke the bear sermons. The pastor read at least... Uh, a portion of what no doubt Stephen said, and Stephen did poke the bear, even to the point to his own death. He, he enraged the crowd. They were so angry, they said, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. The very next verses in that next chapter say, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul's stamp of approval upon the death of Stephen was an encouragement to him. It seemed to be from that place that his hatred continued to grow. You read this account of of the stoning of of Stephen, and it was nothing to Saul, at least it would seem. He wasn't shocked or bored. I think that would be one of the most horrible ways to die, you know, just pounding somebody with stones like that. As a matter of fact, Luke writes that Saul heartily agreed with the execution. He maybe even enjoyed it. Because from this point on, his rage continues to grow. So much so that he dragged people out of their houses and threw them into prison. Acts chapter 9, the continuing rage says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. His heart was black to black, totally bore over by this. Later, after his conversion, he writes to a young Timothy, and speaking of his own testimony, he says, I had been a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. In other words, he caused the injury. He opened up his heart, and you saw exactly what we had read in Acts, and then Paul seeing it even of himself. You know, when we think about people who have no interest in the gospel, people who are actually um, seeking to uh, oppose the gospel and oppose Christianity, people that we would label unreachable, I think we ought to consider the pattern of Paul as being a prime example. And yet Paul is not the perfect example of a person, is he not, who's, no matter how dark the heart is, no matter how corrupted his attitude, that God might reach, God might save, God might deliver, that God might transfer him out of the dominion of darkness into the glorious light of his beloved Son. We think about his life and this road to Damascus. He wasn't a seeker. He wasn't going to Damascus to hear some evangelist. He wasn't there on his horse reading the gospel track or have some uh, sermon on his iPhone as he was riding down, searching and trying to find some spiritual truth. He wasn't struggling with the truth of the gospel. He wasn't doubting his doubts. As a matter of fact, Paul wasn't at least, not in the least worried about Jesus being the Messiah. That was the furthest thing from his mind. He was bent on who he was and what he was doing. And in truth, God wasn't worried either. God simply knocked him off his horse and blinded him. Just like that. The prophet Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. The primest example of that individual, of so, so, so corrupt of character, so anti-Christian, and yet God says, it's nothing to me. God reached out and grabbed this most violent, most aggressive, this most rage-filled anti-Christian Recorded in the scriptures of the first century, he reached out to this one, and with his long arm, his saving love, caused Saul to fall off his horse and fall hopelessly in love with Jesus. For all practical purposes, I think this occurred when Saul the Pharisee came to the place in his life when he saw himself as being spiritually bankrupt. He saw his spiritual life as being completely empty. Nothing, nada, zero, zip. As a matter of fact, he saw himself in being in tremendous debt spiritually. For here was a man who was speaking in his own 
looking at his own self. He says, I'm the primest example of somebody who is working his best. If, if there's anybody who's a great Pharisee, he says, I'm the definition of it. His zeal and his obedience to the law brought him nothing. Look, if you're quick on your trigger, to Philippians 3 and chapter 7, and look at this testimony of this man who um, saw his own bankruptcy. Philippians 3, 7, he says, But what things were gained to me? The advantages of his education, uh, his, his birth, um, his his strict obedience to the law. But the things that I saw that were gained to me, that I held up being like that, those I counted loss for Christ. What if you worked for your two weeks pay or your month's pay and the boss came along and he gave you counterfeit money? You know, monopoly money. He says, here you go. You earned 3000 this month. Here it is in Monopoly money. And you rejoice believing that because the boss gave it to me, because I worked so hard for it, I've earned this Monopoly money. It's good. And that's the attitude of Paul. Totally worthless. Of all his labors and of everything that he had done. And he says, all of that, which I had presumed to be right, I counted as loss. Yea, doubtless I count all things, everything, bankruptcy, spiritually, and everything is lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them, but done that I may win Christ. I not only give up all that I had been, but I look at all that I was, that bankruptcy, and I count it as done because of something even greater. Paul now sees that the knowledge of Christ is a blessing so surpassing, so unequaled, that nothing can match it. I've always been told you're never supposed to use an illustration from your own family, but sweetheart, I've got to. In our bathroom, right off the bedroom, we got a little nightlight. And as far as I'm concerned, I want black, black, dark, and so I can sleep. But Mama gets up at night, and she needs that little, I imagine it's like a two-watt bulb, you know. And to be honest with you, in the darkness of the night, that two-watt bulb looms quite a bit. And so, for the most part, I'll just put the sheet over or something like that, and I'm good. But there are times when she needs to have more light, and she'll reach over and she'll flick on that bed lamp right next to the bed and that's probably a 40 water or something like that and that's when I go what's the matter what's wrong because now I've got this this overwhelming intense light you know you know like that well I get my revenge in the morning especially in the summertime when I pull up the shade and that's facing the sunrise and it just comes in the room that little light is sufficient to see. Even the 40 watt bulb is, is more than sufficient to see. It, it, it illumines a lot. But in comparison to the sun, in comparison to the brightness of the glory of that sun shining in there, there's nothing that compares. And Paul says, of all that I had been, all that I was, I gave it up. For the surpassing, outstanding, above imagination, glory of Jesus Christ. It's like comparing that two watt bulb to the sun. There's no comparison. And he says, I've been living on that two watt bulb all my life, thinking that it was enough when it was far from it. Paul says, everything can go for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Earlier in this same book, Paul says the very same things, but more succinctly. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Basically the same as what we saw there in chapter 3, 7, uh, and 8. Paul says, my sole aim in living is to glorify Christ, for he's the supreme end of my life. 
And I value him more than all of life, of all of the things of life. I value that relationship, the knowledge of who Christ is more than all of life. For to me, to live is Christ. Do you ever say that when you wanted to be pious? <laughs> when you wanted your monks you know, or challenged by a sermon? Yeah, for me to live is Christ. I think we say it kind of lightly sometimes, but not thinking in the deep conviction that all other paths are bankrupt. I don't think we've come to that point in life, like Paul, that we've understood life as a bankruptcy, save for Christ. Take a minute on how the world attempts to disciple you. Every electronic mode of, of, of presenting things, every TV announcer, every newscaster, every broadcast, every magazine, every billboard, everything is out there to disciple you in thinking a certain way. Every, even some Christian ministries, they're building a picture up of what life is. And for the most part, they'll basically say, well, the life is basically made up of toys and trinkets. And the more toys and trinkets, the, the most recent toys and trinkets, the bigger the toys and trinkets, the better, the better you are. Tell me I'm wrong. Listening to the news and they're saying how Facebook has this ability to know what you are viewing and present unto you advertisements or posts that lead up to what you're viewing. Enhance, enforce the things that you will like. The world is making a picture, discipling you, us, of life. Our culture promotes human relationships. It promotes achievements. It promotes skills. Our culture says, for me to live is family. For me to live is my job. For me to live is my talent. And again, we say, well, but for me to live is Christ. But what we really mean at times is for me to live as my version of Christ. Because it's easier to do that than to go to his word and to see who he really is and say, this is the version of Christ that I'm to follow. That's what Paul did. Paul's Old Testament hanging on to that picture of what he thought of his obedience and zeal to that God was overshadowed eventually in his bankruptcy to know the real and living God. For me to live as Christ, there are those today who have the notion that Jesus needs a makeover. You know, a lot of programs talk about, you know, we need a makeover, you get the hairdo, the clothing, and so forth. Jesus needs a makeover to be, to be pertinent and relevant in, in our society today. So we take out these pages and we remove this and we just leave a couple sections of the Bible and say that's how I show that he becomes more relevant to our current generation the millennials or I don't even know all of the names of, <laughs> of how they refer to various generations but brethren Jesus doesn't need a makeover for he is the Alpha and the Omega he excels all of the nonsense thinking he is the sunlight compared to that two-watt bulb, and even more so. Because Jesus is all that he is, surpassing the greatness of all things that are valuable to man. Of all things that are valuable to us, what do we hold value of? Like I said, the world wants us to think of the toys and the trinkets, and wants us to think of this, and this, and this, and this. Ellis Johnson understands right now as he's left all of those things. And he's now in the presence of the one that he so loved. It doesn't mean that things are not good. For God does indeed give good gifts. And he blesses us with them in order that we would enjoy them. He gives them in abundance at times because he knows that by giving things to us to bless us with, there are encouragements in that, and our worship is not only sustained, but our worship is encouraged.
because God supplied, God met the need, and we're happy about that, and we give him praise. But there are times when he holds back those things because he knows our tendency. He knows our hearts. He knows how those things can take me away from who he is. So things aren't necessarily bad. But in every case, Christ alone is worthy of our entire life's affection and devotion. No, he is worthy of that for all eternity. And that's what we know as believers is once we depart from this earth. For all eternity, never tiring of giving him the praise and adoration and attention that he so rightly deserves. Philippians 1, 7, for to me to live is Christ, what's the rest? To die is gain. Now that is not necessarily uh, a thought or, or a principle, an idea that is in the current streams of evangelical thought. I've yet to hear of a conference on that, to die is gain. It seems to be absent, never celebrated. So if you want to depart from this earth and to be with the Lord, the thought of dying and the thought of leaving, we may, especially as we get older and older, we may say, well, I'm really looking forward to that. But for the most part, it's not something that we really cause our great heart's attention to. Understand here that the Apostle Paul wasn't being morbid. He wasn't being suicidal when he wrote these things. To die is gain, and I'm looking forward to my life going. He wasn't depreciating the life that God had given him. He wasn't depreciating the fact that he is the author of life and how precious life is. But to understand that death is gain is to be finally free from the fear of anything. To die is gain. That means there's nothing else that I can be afraid of. The way to the fullness of life is to understand that dying is gain. A second century apologist Justin Martyr said, You can kill us, but you cannot do, do us any real harm. You can kill us, but you can't do us any real harm. To live in the boldness of that statement... Think what a difference the world would be. What's the worst thing that could take place? They could kill your bodies after they tortured you? Sure. That's real. That happens even today. And yet, we have to believe that in those moments the Holy Spirit of God is present in extremely powerful ways as he, as he has in history. And it's proven that. So there is no boundary. In her book, The Shadow of the Almighty, Elizabeth Elliot writes, Is the distinction between living for Christ and dying for him so great? Is not the second the logical conclusion of the first? Living for Christ, dying being gain, isn't dying the logical conclusion of living for Christ? Everything for him, Paul says. I have no ties to anything other than what God's given me, and this is wonderful. I'm living for him. And... The logical tie, the ending of it, the last paragraph, dying is gain. The joy of that relationship. The treasure of finding out what happens. You know, we won't die early. We won't die before our time. <laughs> it's all within his perfect prerogative to deal with us. God knows all of our days that he has for us. And we know that once we leave this body, we will be in the presence of Is there a question? <laughs> that's, that's the idea. Once I leave, I'm in the presence of Jesus. Mom and I were talking about that dear lady who was on the 
flight, that Southwest flight, you know, and the piece of the engine cowling goes back and smacks the window and, and she's there, you know, sucked out and he said, what a horrible way to die. To die, the process of dying, but if she's a believer, the moment that heart stopped, the moment those things took place, she's living in the presence of Christ. It doesn't matter how you die. It doesn't matter all of those things because God's hand is accordingly laid it out for us perfectly. For most young people and healthy people, the idea of death isn't even on their radar. <laughs> I remember as a young person the stupid things I did. The way I lived, and if my parents would have caught me, you know, uh, known about it, you did that, you know, and I wouldn't even go into the exploits. I wasn't afraid of death. It wasn't on my radar. It wasn't even on a thought process. But the older I get, the more doctor visits you get, uh, the more summary of my health conditions, it's not that I'm afraid of it, but it's drawing closer. It becomes a more of a reality in life. So whether it's a reality or not, we have to say once I'm absent from this body, I'll be present with the Lord, and I'm not afraid to go. 10,000 years from now, we won't be dreaming about what cool car I could have had if I would have lived another 10 years and earned more money and had the better car. Or if I lived another five years and taken that vacation around the world, you know. It won't matter. From the perspective of glory, those things are not there. As a Christian, we believe that a better day is coming. And that better day maybe isn't today. The better day maybe isn't next week, maybe not even next year or 10 years from now, but eventually our failing bodies will give way and go into the ground, and then at Christ's return we will see and rise the dead to new and perishable bodies. Brethren, until Christ is our treasure, our motivation for mission work becomes a fool's errand built upon the motivations of man and not the call of God. This type of romanticism soon fails. And I say that simply because from my perspective at my desk, I can't present the work of missions as being some glorified work. And we pray for missionaries and we pray that they'll be used by God, but it's not that all of a sudden they have something, you know, more, more prestigious to come back and says, we've lived in the continent of Asia, or we've, you know, this, and we've done that, and we all, oh, you know. No romantic ideas. They went because they were called of God, and they saw life as the opportunity to be able to say, for me to live is Christ. And it's not sacrificing to do it because he says, I'll supply your needs. And if they die, they die, and they'll be in the presence of Christ, just as if any of us. Missions can become a touchdown in a football game of faith, the end all, the be all. Our motivation must be Christ as our treasure, and that going there, or going anywhere, or doing any of that, should be out of obedience and love for him. He is everything. He is our all. He is my source of tremendous joy. So ask yourself the hard question. Is Christ truly your treasure? Now, remember, Scripture says how deceptive our hearts are. And I'm not poking the bear here, okay? I'm saying sincerely ask yourself, is Christ your treasure? If this was lost, if this was consumed in fire, if this was destroyed, if this one died, if these things occurred in life, would that be the end? Or could we say with Paul, I count them all but dung, I refuse, throw away. It means nothing because Christ is primost in my mind. 
my eyesight, my heart, my treasure. Imagine 500 years from now, 5,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now. I know we can't imagine that, but imagine in the perspective of time how foolish the luxuries of today will seem. We like to watch the show, uh, This Old House, and they go and they start redoing homes that are like 150 years old or whatever, you know, and they get in there and, and the guy tears a piece of uh, paneling off and behind it is some plastered wall with some, you know, beautiful art, uh, woodwork and so forth and he says, somebody made this, you know, with a chisel and wood and it's just so beautiful in this time, but now it's there full of termites and the water got to it and it's all run down and it didn't matter what happened to that house, to that man or that woman who owned it, who built it who put all of their efforts into it because it was gone their tombstone marks their resting place and no matter how elaborate that tombstone may be it doesn't matter so we put it into perspective and think how foolish the luxuries of, of today may look will look guaranteed they will look as we have the perspective of eternity and we look back. I did it all in order that I would gain this. Paul says, no, I've done it all. I've gained it all. And I just says, it's bankruptcy. It's monopoly money. Workers are needed in the harvest. People out in our world today with hearts in darkness, yet they are set apart before they were born. Sons and daughters purchased by his blood, and they will be found, they will be saved, they will be rescued, they will be ransomed, and he will use some of us, dear Christians, to do just that. We don't know their names, and we don't know how it can be done and accomplished, but it's in his hands. You see, we get to play a part we get to go, we get to pray, we get to send. And every believer gets to be caught up in this mission. Each one of us, as we go to him and says, you are my treasure. I don't need this. I don't have to have this. You are my treasure. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to make that application? What's this coming Thursday? April 26. Anybody know? What's the title of my message? Take your daughters and sons to work. Take your daughters and sons to You win the prize, Pastor. Yes. Take your daughters and sons to work day. Started, I think it was in 1992, it was take your daughters to work. Maybe they thought that sons were always working. I don't know. A few years later, they added sons to it. And it was in the idea to be able to get them engaged and so forth. You know what? Your heavenly father has been trying to engage you in that very same thing each and every day. He's tried to say, I want to take my sons and my daughters to work with me today. His spirit is working in the hearts of the lost. And he just needs somebody, one of his children, one of his sons or daughters to go and say, would you read this track? Can I share with you something? Hey, I notice you've been sitting here crying. What's the matter? How can I help out? There's a, a knock at the door, a phone call, an email, a letter from the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions and says, you know, how do I respond? It's his desire that we do. Victory is sure because it has already been secured by the shed blood of Christ. Men and women from every tribe and tongue and nation on this earth, may they pour out their times and their energies, their talents and their gifts and their passions, their very lives for this mission. We see results, and it's just not us in the United States doing it, but we see generational results in Kenya, Bible College, and we're having second and third generation young men coming and so my grandfather studied here. My father studied here. And it's cycling. It's, it's growing. Bonnie mentioned about the number of churches in, in that particular 
uh, section of, of the Independent Presbyterian Church in Kenya. Growth, you know, they need more. To live is Christ, and in him to die is truly gain. Ask God to help you to evaluate your heart. Ask him to make his richest treasure known to you. And may you find satisfaction in him. And may you see the things that are around us in the world as they decay and as they rust, as they fall apart. May we see that as total bankruptcy. As you listen to the, your neighbor, the person you work next to, and as they grumble about this problem and this issue and so forth and so on, can you see in their life the bankruptcy that they're experiencing? They may have buko bucks, all kinds of tangible things in this world, but their heart is bankrupt. May God open our eyes to see their condition, that we can profit in them the living Savior, that we can truly say to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, in the quietness of these few moments this Sunday morning, we ask that you would again open our eyes to the beauty, the exclusive beauty, the tremendous idea of who our Savior is. Not too distant from the remembrances of Easter in the empty tomb, but the picture of our Savior today, standing on the right hand of our Heavenly Father, pleading for us, in order that we might come to know him better and to see him, even as Paul saw him, that we would see ourselves as bankrupt in the things of this world, but to see the treasure that for me, my life, living is Jesus Christ and him alone. And when that work on earth is done, we can say, to die will indeed be gain. And may it encourage us to know that there is no tie on this earth that can bind us, that we have the joy and the freedom in Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen.